to welcome you this morning to uh, what I think is a very important meeting um, to uh, unveil this, uh, this very, very important report on one of the most uh, horrendous uh, situations regarding uh, the abuse of uh, human rights uh, and a minority people's rights that is taking place anywhere in the world today, arguably the worst situation in the entire world. I want to begin um, on a high note, which is to sort of say that how delighted we are that Ulam Toti um, has been awarded the Sakharov Prize. I think that's just extremely important um, to recognize Ilham Toti. Um, his, he's an economist. Um, his work, as I understand it, has basically been focused on exposing, explaining, and analyzing uh, the Bing Tuan system in uh, East Turkestan, the system that was imposed in 1954, a system of colonization, a system of uh, exploitation, a system of uh, controlling the population and repressing the population, which is an important instrument of Chinese uh, control in East Turkestan uh, today. And uh, when he received this award, the Chinese Foreign Ministry um, condemned the European Parliament, which gives the award, uh, saying that they were intervening in Chinese internal affairs and they were celebrating a terrorist. Um, and you know, let us be very blunt about it. This is really, really despicable. Um, and it shows the level to which China has sunk in labeling someone like uh, Ilham Toti um, a terrorist. Um, basically, what they're saying is that anyone who supports uh, Uyghur culture, uh, the practice of the Muslim faith, uh, is a terrorist by definition. Um, this is why they arrested uh, Mohammed Saleh Hajim, uh, a religious scholar who died in uh, prison, uh, the academic Rahil Dawood, uh, the, the folk singer Abdul Abdul Rahim uh, Haid. Uh, all of these people are considered to be terrorists because they support the survival uh, of a people. Uh, and what this shows is that the Beijing regime is engaged in a process of cultural genocide against uh, the, the Uyghur people in East Turkestan. And this is what the report is about, the report that we're going to be discussing this morning about the destruction of the mosques and the, demol the demolishing of the faith of the Uyghur people is all about. This is a crime against humanity. I mentioned just a moment ago Rahil Daoud, and this is what she said about it. If one were to remove these shrines, the Uyghur people would lose contact with earth. They would no longer have a personal, cultural, and spiritual history, and after a few years, we would not have a memory of why we live here or where we belong. Uh, this is in, indeed um, cultural genocide. And I want to, I've done this many times, but I'm going to do it again this morning. I want to condemn uh, the silence in the Muslim world. Um, I mean, there's a, a widespread silence, so there's less silence now. The award to Ilham Toti being an example of that, there's less silence now than there has been, but the Muslim world has been not only silent, uh, but actually complicitous. Um, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown, uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, who was responsible for the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, we just uh, commemorated the anniversary of that murder. Um, he went to China in February, and he went on Chinese television and supported, announced his support for what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghur people because he said this is fighting, this is fighting terrorism. And it is, um, it is, uh, it is just completely despicable. Uh, and it's widespread, uh, this, uh, you know, the complicity uh, and the silence. The report uh, that we're going to be discussing this morning, the information uh, for this report, a lot of it, and not all of it, but a lot of it was based upon reports uh, in, uh, that have been carried by the Uyghur service, the Uyghur language service 
of Radio Free Asia. And I'm delighted to say I just, um, you know, Friday just picked up by chance The Economist magazine. Some of you have seen it, but I urge you to look at it. A lead editorial praising the Uyghur service um, and also an article in the, in the edition describing what they've done. And it's absolutely heroic. And in my view, I think what the Uyghur service of Radio Free Asia has done is equivalent to what Jan Karski and Jan Novak did during the Second World War in trying to expose to the world, to make the world aware uh, of the Nazi Holocaust. We would not know, uh, really, what is happening in East Turkestan, the, the concentration camps, the destruction of the mosques, the, mosques, the destruction of the people, uh, without what they're doing. And we're delighted to have with us this morning, you know, as one of our speakers, Olim Seitov, who is the director of the Uyghur service, Omar Khanat, who used to be a senior editor there and is now, of course, a founder of our co-sponsoring organization this morning, the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, Elise Anderson, who is gloriously uh, named the Lu Xiaobo Fellow of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. That's, a, that's wonderful. What a great honor to be having a position named after Lu Xiaobo. It's just wonderful. And then, of course, the author of the report, Bahram uh, Sintash. I want to thank Akram Karam for everything he's done to put on this meeting, and I want to especially recognize uh, this morning uh, Luisa Griva, uh, who uh, taught me about the Uyghur issue f over 15 years ago. She mentored me in understanding this problem because she has always been focused on it. And now I, I guess this is news that she's the global advocacy director of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, and they are very, very fortunate to have her. She's just, she's really, really devoted to this cause in a way that, you know, no one, uh, you know, no one that I've worked with has ever been so dedicated to this particular cause and, to, and highlighting it early on before it became known uh, as, as such a grave human rights problem. So um, welcome this morning. I want to call upon Omar to uh, uh, introduce the program. Omar. Good morning, everybody. So I would like first thank uh, National Endowment for Democracy uh, for hosting this event and for supporting uh, UHRP's human rights documentation work for more than a decade. We are truly grateful. Our new report presents evidence of complete or partial destruction of over 100 mosques. This is important because the Chinese government claim uh, claims to be respecting freedom of worship. It strongly denies that these dem demolitions are taking place. Therefore, it is quite dangerous for anyone in East Turkestan to provide evidence of what is happening. Providing this kind of information will almost certainly mean you will be detained yourself. But because we have these satellite images, along with photographs, that Bahram has collected, these desecration cannot be entirely hidden. Bahram has also gone deeper into the meaning of this destruction by speaking with people who know or knew these mosques very well. He spoke with Ali Jan Hassan, a researcher in Islamic culture, left, uh, left East Turkestan in 2016 and is now living in the Middle East. Bahram talked with him about the Kiria Mosque. It is oldest and largest mosque in East Turkestan and has witnessed 800 years of Uyghur history. Ali Jan Hassan told Bahram, quote, I always prayed at this mosque when I visited Kiria. The last time I visited when I was, uh, when, uh, was when I attended my cousin's wedding and I took picture with the the groomsmen in front of the gate. For the safety of other people who are in, in the photo, I cannot share it, unquote. So this is the situation, even sharing past photographs of community experience at these mosques may be too dangerous to the people who used to pray at them. It is almost uh, also 
Important to note that the imams who oversee these mosques have been targeted for severe and inhuman, inhuman treatment. The goal appears to be to permanently remove religious leaders from society and not re-educate them, as official propaganda suggests. Of course, all imams were already vetted by the government. For several years before the crisis began, in 2017, they were forced to give sermons that were written for them by the government, praising government policy. Still, once the crisis began, this provided no protection. They were taken away in mass. Many have been given very long prison sentences. One of the few camp survivors, Erbol Ergali in Kazakhstan, has stated that imams in detention with him were sentenced to 20 years imprisonment and kept constantly shackled. Another former detainee, Amanjan Seytuli, said that in his cell were not only imams, but also people employed as guards and cleaners at mosques, as well as people who had registered at mosques before praying. Many religious leaders have died in custody. On January 29 last year, in 2018, UHRP received confirmation from relatives of Muhammad Salih Hajim that he died in an internment camp. Muhammad Salih Hajim was a prominent chronic scholar and Uyghur religious leader. He translated Quran from Arabic into Uyghur uh, on be, uh, on, in the request of the Chinese government. He was tw uh, 82 years old when he was taken into the custody at the end of 2017. His daughter, Nazira Muhammad Saleh, and other relatives were also taken away at the same time. This is only one of many similar cases where the entire family of religious leader has been taken away to the camp. Hussein, Hussein Qari Hajim, the oldest Imam of Kiriya Mosque, went missing in 2017, and there is no news of him. Amin Damulam received a life sentence in 2017. He was a graduate from the first court of the Xinjiang Islamic Institute and was assigned to the Kiriya Mosque as Imam by the government in 1992. Abdul Abdul Ahad Maksum is another noted religious scholar who died in custody. He died while being held in an internment camp in Khotan Prefecture in November 2017, although his death was not reported until May 2018. Abdul Rashid Saleh is one, uh, another uh, religious scholar who died in June 2018 in Ugolja. He was a neighbor, our neighbor back in East Turkestan in Nilka County. And uh, I spent uh, several days with him when he visited uh, Turkey, Istanbul in uh, 1996. His body was uh, given to, uh, to his family in June 2018, his head was covered with a white sheet. A blood stain was visible from a distance. The family members were not allowed uh, to take part in his burial and was not allowed to touch the body. The targeting of civil society should also be noted. This started early the case of Ablizaji is a prime example. Ablizaji was one of many faithful Uyghur Muslims who worked to rebuild neighborhood and village mosques. He managed the voluntary contributions for the construction of a mosque in near Khotan. He was arrested in 2015. He was tortured to force him to hand over the names of the people who made donations. He refused to cooperate and was handed a 10-year prison sentence. The widespread destruction of mosques, shrines, and cemeteries 
and the systematic elimination of religious scholars and teachers from society make one thing very clear. There can be no doubt about Chinese government's goal regarding the future of the Uyghur people. This is a step-by-step -step campaign to erase Uyghur sacred places in Uyghur religious practice from the faith face of the earth. It's a clear indicator of genocidal intent. I can say more about the specific policy recommendation in the discussion. For now, I will note that UHRP is again calling on UNESCO in concerned governments to take urgent action to stop the systematic destruction of people and their faith. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bahram Santaj. I'm really uh, honorable time for me um, to present my research. Uh, thanks for NED, uh, UHRP, and everyone in this room. Uh, Mr. Umar Qanat uh, included the very important evidence in his analysis in his uh, speech. Um, now I, I want to present my presentation with the the images with, uh, and the other uh, evidences that I uh, found during my research. Um, so, uh, Uyghurs been living in deep pain and suffering. Uh, millions of Uyghurs have been detained. Uh, Uyghur mosques, cemeteries, uh, neighborhoods being demolished in every cities and townships and villages in Uyghur homeland. Uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region uh, become uh, a police and surveillance state unlike the world has ever seen. And Uyghurs become the enemies of the country in their own homeland. Uh, to start uh, present my presentation, I want to uh, tell a little bit about Uyghur Islamic architecture. Um, over the thousands of years, uh, thousands of mosques, uh, medrasas, and uh, mazars uh, were uh, built all over the Uyghur land. And they used a combination of Arabic and Indian uh, and Tarim civilization architecture style. Uh, Uyghur, uh, Uyghur construction uh, techniques uh, influenced Islamic architecture uh, through Central Asia. It's a unique uh, contribution to world civilization and it's completely different from Chinese civilization. So, um, to, uh, during my re uh, when I started to do this research, uh, I had uh, the idea of uh, starting why I start and why should I research on this topic. Because my background in architecture design, uh, so I love my, uh, my uh, designs of Islamic uh, architecture. This is the first thing come to my mind, so seeing this as my duty to do, it. because it's very beautiful architecture in all around the uh, Uyghur homeland. So the, one of the most uh, beautiful architecture uh, is a mosque in, uh, in a Kargalak city in the southern part of uh, Uyghur homeland. It was demolished in, uh, in 2018. And then that's the key point, how I guess through start this, in, uh, present, uh, this research. So starting by the first uh, demolished mosque, and I keep looking on uh, Google imageries, uh, I found uh, 100, uh, f more than 150 demolished, uh, architect, uh, demolished mosques uh, and other Islamic sites. And so, so, we have to know how many uh, mosques um, are in, in Uyghur homeland. So to start uh, this, uh, we, the Chinese have officially uh, confirmed it, and they have 24,300 mosques. Um, this is the number before 
uh, before the, the most are demolished. This is the the, the, the official uh, uh, number of in 2017. So, but in 1950, there are 13,300 mosques. So the mosque number increased uh, less than one time than compared to 1950. And the most Muslim population increased to uh, 40 million, uh, 300,000, and the 1950 was 4.4 million. So Muslim population increased uh, a little bit more than two times. And so the other, com we had to compare the number, like um, we have a neighbor country, Pakistan is also uh, most Islam, uh, Muslim population live in, the, in this country. And uh, this is the same in the Uyghur homeland where the minority, majority of people are Muslims, so we have to compare this way. China always claimed um, there are many mosques in, in Uyghur homeland, and they also compare this number to the mosque in the United States, say oh, we have a lot of mosques in, in, in Uyghur homeland, so we uh, protecting Islam in, in, in Uyghur homeland. So, but as actual number, we compare the citizen per mosque, mean um, the 580 people in pray in, in in, in Uyghur Hunan Mosque, and uh, 148 people can pray in one mosque in Pakistan. So this is the official number divided to the population. Uh, then we can get this number, 580, but this is the number before demolishing the all other mosques. So it's not a lot of mosques in, in Uyghur Hunan. So uh, we have to compare the number to the, the most minority Islamic uh, country then we can see the right number. Is it a lot of must in, in Uyghur homeland or, or not? So next one, um, how many must uh, religious sites are actually the most in Uyghur homeland? Um, so um, actually, it's not possible to research on the thousands of mosques, but so far I collected uh, more than 150 demolished, must, uh, demolished uh, religious sites. This including mosques and cemeteries and uh, uh, shrines uh, and other religious sites. So uh, most of our um, uh, Uyghur mosques and the Uyghur region is the wide land. So, so many uh, small mosques are actually located in uh, Uyghur towns and uh, small villages. And those, much, those mosque sites are smaller than other mosques in, uh, in the townships and cities. So it's very hard to identify on a Google image or a picture uh, to see the, the, the most sites. So the, my research mainly, uh, the, the evidence in my research is mainly in the mosques are located in uh, cities and townships so, to, because those mosques are larger and easy to identify uh, using uh, the Google imagery. Uh, so uh, the one, yeah, my research, uh, I can prove 150 the most sites. This, and during my research, I found like, to compare this number to the each city. For example, in Hoten, there are the most about 15 most in only allowing the Hoten city. And this means this entire mosque in Hoten city are demolished. Only one mosque left, and, but the mosque is the door of the mosque is closed 24-7. Not the Muslims can pray in the mosque. Means the entire mosque in the city are demolished. So this is a percentage for the Hoten city. Maybe 80% of mosques are the most in Hoten. The other city, uh, like 40, 30, a different uh, look, uh, area and look, different cities, uh, the number of the demolished sites are different. But, so my conclusion uh, during my research, I can say like 30 to 50% uh, religious sites, this including like mosques and uh, cemeteries, are demolished. So this number could reach 10,000 to 15,000 religious sites are now like destroyed uh, since 2017. You know, you know. Um, uh, this is the map of uh, Eagle region. 
So I have the list of the demolished sites. Uh, these are the coordinations of the each demolished site. So, so far I have 150 uh, locations. And this gives you ideal look and uh, how demolished mass. Like this straight all around the Xinjiang, north and south, east and also west. So these are the, some of the uh, larger masts that can represent the rest, rest of other demolished masts. So starting by uh, this, this mast, I, uh, this is the uh, Kargalik uh, Grand Mast. I went to this location when I was uh, 22, when I, um, when I was learning architecture uh, design. And this, it's very beautiful mast, and it's demolished. As you can see from the Google imagery, and on this side, I'm sorry, yeah. Has to be in I'm sorry for the, uh, the t t uh, this, this has to be uh, showing the demolished side. Uh, yeah, and now we can see, I'm sorry for that. Um, actually, in the, in the before after picture, we could see the mass will be disappear on the second picture, but I don't know, it doesn't work right here. So this mass can prove 100% this mass are demolished. This mass is demolished. And the other mass, like the largest mass in, in Uyghur region, uh, so uh, as you can see, the, the after picture you can see the, the mosque gone in the map, uh, Google imagery. So this, this is the one of the largest mosques and uh, about 13,000 people can pray in mosque in one time. So, and this mosque has 800 years of history uh, and located in uh, Kyria. Uh, so this is, this is the one of the, the most mosques. And this is the other the most must, and as you can see, the before after fissure, the mustard will disappear. And this is the um, one of the new must uh, located in north northern part of Uyghur homeland. And the China not only demolished old must, they also demolished new brand new must like this. This other must in uh, look uh, in Aksu City. Uh, this this is also new must. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's nothing wrong with the mosque. Uh, so China demolished this kind of architectures and Islamic sites and mosque. And this is the other mosque in, um, in Khoten. Uh, this is the, one of the oldest mosques in Khoten city. And I want to read the, one of my interviews. Uh, um, he said, I learned this mosque was demolished in 2017 along with dozens of other popular mosques in Hoten City. Uh, the in front of Hoten Itka Mosque was like a Times Square of Hoten. It, it took all my happiness and life, uh, lifestyle was when it was destroyed. Today, uh, that corner is empty. The people are gone. So one of the guy, person who, who's from uh, Hoten City, and the, the, after this mosque demolished, all, all his uh, memories, and uh, when he was young, now it, it's not, um, it's all gone, I mean, so the streets are empty. So uh, he was uh, explained even more deeply, said um, he, he's not only uh, worrying about uh, his people and his family members, now he's worrying about uh, this entire Hoten city now is uh, not uh, belong to Muslims. Now there's no mosque in the city, so he's worrying about also the, the religion in, in Khoten. So this is the other uh, beautiful mosque uh, in Atush, and brand new mosque and very beautiful architecture. Uh, China destroyed um, this architecture as well. And this is other mosque uh, in Maitag, uh, this is also one of the new mosques in my uh, in this the twelve iconic mosques. Uh, it's also destroyed and de completely demolished. And this is the other mosque. Uh, actually, this is this unfinished mosque. It, it, it was uh, one of the person uh, in the age of 80, 80 years old. Uh, he collected uh, money. 
to uh, build a beautiful mosque for his people in his uh, village. And he collected about uh, 3 million yuan. And in his the money was entire, his uh, collect, collected money in, in entire life. Uh, so um, that mosque uh, was uh, under construction. Uh, the government uh, demolished this mosque before this mosque completely uh, built. And uh, as uh, there's a picture like uh, this is the person who built this mosque. And China, uh, Chinese uh, local uh, authorities uh, detained his uh, two of his son. And this person, uh, age of 83 years old. And China forcibly shaved his braid, braid before they demolished the mosque. And uh, this is the, and um, her daughter live in uh, Turkey and he, she said, in 2017 I saw a picture of my father after they demolished the mosque and before I, com before I completed the last connection with him. The, uh, in the picture my father looked like uh, he had lost his soul. Uh, so the government took all of his, all of his um, things, his family members, and the most, the most. So this is what, what happened in, in, in Uyghur Hunan now. Um, this is the other mosque uh, located in uh, 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 Korla city. Uh, this is also one of the most mosques. And this is the other one in, um, uh, near, uh, in the southern part of Uyghur homeland. This is also the most. And this was located in Urimchi city, uh, uh, where, where I come from. And then I, I know this mosque because I, I always go to this mosque to pray uh, when I was young. And as you can see from the picture, the police uh, stayed in front of the mosque. And I say this picture on Chinese uh, internet. Uh, so, and as you can see, the uh, Google imagery, the must must disappear. And this is the other mosque, uh, also located in Urimchi. And this is this uh, mosque, uh, located in one of the busiest street in Urimchi. And uh, as you can see, this is the this is the street, and this is the mosque belong to the Muslims in this street. And uh, this the mosque is gone. Uh, as you can see this picture, you could spy something. What is, what is the difference from in this two pic picture? Yes, yeah. Yeah, as you can see, uh, the doom, the, one of the largest doom in Uyghur homeland, uh, diameter of 20 meters. Uh, so then the, after three months, uh, this is the party meeting in uh, Hoten city, and the doom was uh, covered by a octagon shaped uh, structure. But Doom was still uh, inside. Now the other picture, uh, then I, uh, I found the evidences of. Um, the, the first imagery, the Doom was still there. The other one covered it by a Shape, uh, octagon shaped structure, and the third one, the doom did completely removed the, on top of the building. So this building belongs to a Uyghur uh, businessman. Uh, this is a department store, but but the but the design of the building is Islamic. Um, but uh, in Chinese eye, uh, not only most the other architecture. Uh, which has an Islamic style, uh, was, were also the target to uh, destroy. So in, in your homeland, there's a thousand of other uh, architecture, uh, are the, their dooms and the towers uh, also uh, have destroyed. And this is the other uh, department store, as you can see. And the doom, there are the three domes on top of building, and then the other picture, the dooms are removed. Uh, 
China not only destroyed uh, religious sites and mosques, they also demolished Uyghur neighborhood. Uh, this is the city, uh, the Asian city uh, in southern part of uh, Uyghur land called uh, uh, Kuchar. Um, as you can see the imageries. In, in three months, uh, local authorities demolished entire Uyghur neighborhoods. In the red, in the red line, there the neighborhoods are. It's very scary because uh, how can uh, government can do such a uh, campaign to move thousands of maybe 10,000 of people in a very short time and demolish their neighborhood and build new uh, buildings. So what kind of force they use when they order people to move out from their neighborhoods? So as you can see, uh, China can do anything they want to do. They destroyed Uyghur neighborhoods, like as you can see this picture. At least uh, 2,000 people can live in this neighborhood, this part of the Kuchar city. In three months, they changed it to build desert, empty land. They're building new uh, construction on it. So why China uh, demolish Uyghur neighborhood? Because China uh, need this land and wanna, they change everything that make it suit to the Chinese populations because the ordinary Uyghur neighborhoods, as you can see, the neighborhood in Kuchar, we have mosque, we have street like this. This is for Uyghur, uh, Uyghurs, but that picture on the right side uh, provided by a French reporter when he visited uh, Octu City in, the, in uh, July in 2019. And he, he sent this picture and said, I cannot, um, this, there's no difference. Uh, the entire city, just like inner Chinese cities, uh, if you visit this location, you couldn't uh, consider this is a uh, Uyghur neighborhood, a Uyghur town. So this, these, there are so many new uh, buildings in Chinese architecture style uh, have been built all around this neighborhood and in this uh, Aktu town, town. So this is, this is what they're doing. They demolished Uyghur neighborhood and turned it into Chinese uh, cities, China towns. Um, China, and this is the most horrific thing uh, in my uh, research, uh, that not only um, Uyghurs, alive Uyghurs, or the most, they destroyed the dead Uyghurs' home. We means this is the, uh, demolished Uyghur cemeteries. They demolished entire cemetery in uh, Hotan city in, in, in one month. Uh, Again, the same, what kind of force they use to let people, um, the most people's symmetry, no one can against this. China can, they, they, can, they can do anything they want to do. Uh, if, if they want to destroy their uh, people's uh, the symmetry, they can do whatever they want to do. And this is the other symmetry, the demolished. So many evidences. So, um, why China destroyed Uyghur um, religious sites? Um, my question is, China wants to eliminate uh, in, a nation. Uh, China has been uh, eliminated Uyghur language from schools. Now they start to eliminate the, the religion. So, without 
must Muslim become religiously homeless in their homeland. Because Muslims call mosques are the God's home and where Muslims feel God's mercy and being themselves close to God. Without mosques, Muslims can't deliver their religion to next generation. So, so only problem, uh, so the only problem China has understood with Uyghurs, the distance uh, of two cultures which are never uh, been easily uh, assimilated to into another. This is the China's final solution to destroy uh, Uyghur uh, identity and Uyghur religion, Islam in Uyghur homeland. Um, yeah, as you can see in this picture, there's, there's uh, Uyghur scholars, and my father is one of the Uyghur scholars who has uh, been in de uh, detained in a concentration camp. Uh, I lost connection with my father uh, in past t 20 months. Uh, I learned my father's uh, detention in, uh, uh, in uh, February 2018. Uh, since then, I have no information about my father. So only thing I can do in here uh, to raise my voice uh, and become um, one of the Uyghur activists who can save their people, also uh, the culture. So um, the background, uh, my, uh, what I studying in a college is architecture design. So, uh, so I see the uh, importance of exposing this, uh, in, the evidence of uh, the crime against Uyghurs and also humanity. The, the, uh, so the, the evidence is more important for any report. So if I could provide more evidences, then uh, this, this could be one way to save our culture. China could stop uh, if we expose their crimes in our homeland. So uh, I will keep doing uh, more research on uh, find the rest of other uh, demolished uh, sites. Uh, so far, I collected 150 demolished sites. Uh, this could be uh, reached to 500, maybe 600. Uh, how much I could find, I could define uh, what we are doing is right, that what China is doing is a crime against humanity. So, uh, hope uh, everyone become uh, my voice and, and uh, my only wish to see my father and there's other to save my culture. So, uh, hope more people be involved into this action to save our people, our scholars, and our culture, also our religion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Joseph, and I'm the Vice President for Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, let me start by simply echoing what Carl said in the beginning and really pay tribute to the Uyghur Human Rights Project and RFA and everyone else engaged in this. Uh, this strikes me as one of the world's most pressing human rights issues, and the more we learn about it, the better we understand it. It simply helps draw attention to it. It is a difficult problem, and I would just applaud Bahram and the work you've done, I thought this was a phenomenal report. I thought the, the nature of the report, the documentation, the evidence you've amassed really does a huge service to helping the world better understands what, understand what's happening. Uh, I think we often look at the, the humans, human misery and you see the, the suffering, the concentration camps, all of the human rights violations, but looking at the symbols, the architecture, and how that relates to the history, the culture, the people has really been extremely valuable. But before we turn to the audience for questions and answers, I wanted to give each of our three panelists, Carl introduced them all in the beginning, uh, a few minutes just to offer reflections on the report um, and what you've taken away from it. So why don't we start uh, with Alam on my far left. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think uh, I really appreciate NED for organizing this very important, timely event. 
Thank you, Carl, and uh, for the great shout out for RFA and also for Beckham and UHRP's report. And uh, Beckham's uh, research, I think I'm deeply, deeply impressed. He has presented a very powerful and hard evidence to basically to prove that China is not only demolishing the historic Uyghur mosques, but also destroying Uyghur cemeteries with uh, powerful satellite images, whatnot. And he has basically uh, successfully debunked the Chinese government's, uh, in a way, narrative to say that China has uh, uh, respect the Uyghur people and respect the Islamic faith of the Uyghurs. And uh, when you read, whenever the Global Times, China often uh, tried to rebut, the, you know, especially uh, American or Western criticism of China's religious repression as basically saying, you know, we have more mosques, uh, you know, more people, Muslims can per capita can enter the mosque, they can pray more than America and the rest of the world. But in fact, you know, from Beckham's research, you can clearly see that's not the case. In fact, uh, uh, majority of the Uyghur mosques have been demolished by the Chinese authorities in the past two years. At Radio Free Asia, uh, since Chen Chuanguo was appointed as the new party secretary of the Uyghur homeland uh, in uh, August 2016, uh, as you know, he came from Tibet after pacifying Tibet. So then he started uh, all these uh, new policies. And one of the policies we're aware that uh, we have covered a lot, uh, the basically the creation of all these internment camps that have detained a million or more, up to three million Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and the other uh, indigenous Turkic peoples. In addition to that, China has targeted uh, Uyghur religious beliefs. And uh, uh, we also interviewed U.S. ambassador at large for religious freedom, uh, ambassador Sam Brownback. He basically said China is at war with Islam, and what China is doing to the Uyghur people is wrong. And uh, what China has been doing, uh, uh, as you can see, it is at war with Islam and trying to eradicate Uyghur religious beliefs and uh, uh, the physical embodiment of uh, Uyghur people's beliefs, mosques, cemeteries, things like that. And also we had, uh, you know, China, of course, doing this under the pretext of its fighting terrorism, and it is fighting against religious extremism. When we entered Ambassador Sam Brownback, also U.S. Ambassador on Counterterrorism, Nathan Sells, both of them say that China is not fighting terrorism here. China is not fighting extremism. China is doing an ugly repression of the Uyghur people by targeting Uyghur people's religious faith, by targeting Islam, and also by systematically, you know, uh, eradicating Uyghur's religious beliefs. In addition to the destruction of the mosques, demolition of the Uyghur historic cemeteries, uh, China is, <coughs> you know, you can see China is also forbidding Uyghurs from fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. China is forbidding Uyghurs to take Hajj. Now, as Muslims, just like Christians and uh, uh, Jews, you have religious duties to follow. You have to fulfill. The Uyghurs are not allowed to follow this. Uh, you know, religious duties. We have covered, for example, one imam who sent his son to study Islam for one day, like five years ago. He was detained because of that. Not something happened after Chen Chuanguo came, but five years ago. And another Uyghur uh, philanthropist, you know, we interviewed him. And because he uh, you know, went Hajj uh, many, many years ago, he was a very wealthy man in Ulja, helped the Uyghur local community. He was sentenced to death. We interviewed his younger brother who said he was sentenced to death. And a couple of more points I'd like to raise quickly. I know time is very tight. And uh, we reported also China not only demolishing the mosques, uh, they're locking up a lot of these mosques. Some of the mosques, they completely transferred them into Chinese Communist Party propaganda centers. They, uh, they removed the crescent moon on top, they plant the China's atheistic communist red flag, and they remove the inscription right on top of the mosque. When you enter, usually there is a, you know, there is no God but God, you know, the inscription on top. They erase that. They put the red, big red banner that said, love party, love country. And on both sides of the wall of the mosque, usually uh, there are verses, Islamic verses on both sides. They completely erase them. They either block them or put more Chinese propaganda. I think one last point I'd like to highlight before I end my speech is, now, 
In early January this year, Chinese government, especially China's Islamic Association, state that China is going to synthesize Islam in the next five years. And we report on that as well. So synthesize, you know, it's very interesting. What does it mean, synthesize? Synthesization. Basically, that's, that's in a way Chinese-ization, if there is such a word. Just to make Islam Chinese or under our communist Chinese. We know China is ruled by the Communist Party. Communist Party is an atheistic party. It doesn't believe in Islam or any other religions. So China is planning to guide and uh, Islam. And it, uh, what is said there? Guide, mobilize, and inspire Chinese Muslims uh, you know, using these uh, new guidelines. And China is also uh, rewriting Islam's holy book, the Quran. You know, uh, just like Christians and Jews, they see, uh, Muslims see Quran as the holy book of God, and nothing in it can be altered, changed, or modified. But China is doing exactly that, so they can use the new Quran to guide uh, the Uyghur people. So five years from now, we do not know what kind of Islam uh, will remain in China, or especially in the Uyghur homeland, and what kind of religion uh, will be passed on to the next generation by the Uyghur people to their own people. And uh, I have more things to say, but uh, I think my time has run out, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Perfect. Let me turn to Elise <coughs> now. To okay. Let me make sure this is on. All right, um, so thank you very much to the NED and the UHRP for inviting me to be here today. Thank you also to Behram for his wonderful research and wonderful presentation of it. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this event and speaking to you. Apologies, I'm going to try to stick really closely to a script uh, just for the sake of time. So in April 2017, authorities in the uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region published a list of 29 band names all of which were connected to Islam in one way or another as part of its then new Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region Regulation on De-Extremification. At the time, I had already been researching and watching the region closely for more than a decade. And I had, in fact, lived in Urumqi, the regional capital, from 2012 to 2016, um, where I saw the political situation worsening drastically month to month and year to year. This regulation, though, struck me as something particularly absurd and also particularly alarming. I remember thinking about how invasive it was, even for China, and I wondered what was to come. And what was to come, of course, was and remains quite horrible. Over the two years that have followed since then, two and a half, um, increasingly new worse news has trickled and then poured out of the Uyghur region. So we've seen a dystopian surveillance state, mass detention, mass internment, mass incarceration, the infiltration of Han cadres into Uyghur homes, curbs on religion, language, and culture, the closure of institutions, large-scale forced labor, and more. Uh, and then from starting from last year and into this year, thanks to a series of compelling satellite imagery photos like those that we just saw in Bahram's presentation, News has begun spreading that the CCP is destroying sacred sites en masse, mosques, shrines, and even cemeteries, all gone from the map. It is this last point, the destruction of sacred sites, that Bahram Sintash helps us to understand more fully in this important new report that he produced with the Uyghur Human Rights Project. There are a lot of things that stuck out to me from this report, but I want to focus my commentary on the relationship between religion, and cultural identity for many Uyghurs. When I read this report, I am struck by the comments, especially by the comments and the interviews uh, that Bahram, the researcher, con conducted with Uyghurs who are living across the globe. In their comments, so many of them explicitly connect mosque, mosques and shrines to Uyghur culture and to a sense of Uyghur identity. Mm. They mourn the loss of these mosques, these shrines, and other sacred sites, because this loss means a bigger cultural loss, a loss of tradition as well. Um, you know, not all Uyghurs are Muslim, certainly, and not all Muslim Uyghurs are um, especially devout, but so many aspects of Islamic belief and practice have become an inextricable part of everyday Uyghur landscapes, soundscapes, and so forth. So raising hands in dua or prayer at the end of a meal, 
the resonant sounds of the call to prayer that used to, to ring out loud on Fridays around the time of the midday namaz. Uh, the sights of domes, naves, the crescent moon and star right, on architecture across the region. Um, I also remember the altered rhythms of business and social life during Ramadan. Everything changed when people were fasting during Ramadan. So I was in the Uyghur region for quite a long time to research classical music and its place in broader Uyghur culture. I'm, and I focus mostly on contemporary politics and the contemporary manifestations of the music, but I'll never forget the advice that someone offered me in a chance encounter in a bookshop, kind of early on in my research, which was, until you understand Islam, you foreigner you. You will never understand muqam. You will never understand this music. You will never understand this culture if you don't understand Islam. And so I attempted to. I traveled to shrine festivals uh, like that at Imam Asim um, back in June 2011. Bahram actually mentions that in the report. Um, I accompanied the scholar Raila Dawood, whose name you heard earlier, uh, to interviews like one in 2016. As recent as 2016, we interviewed the leader of a Sufi women's circle in Turpan. I visited mosques and shrines and other holy sites, often accompanied by officials from state-supported cultural institutions that were responsible for managing these sites. So, right, so it speaks to the state's promotion for, for a very long time of Islam and Islamic material and other culture. Um, in 2015, I'll share a, a brief story, an acquaintance and her aunt took my mother and me to visit the tomb of Mahmoud Kashgari, a famed scholar near Kashgar. Uh, this, is, this particular site is certainly a tourist spot, um, but it's also a holy site. It's, a, it's one of those instances, again described in this wonderful report, of a holy site being kind of co-opted in some senses by the state so that it comes in to manage it. Uh, it creates a cultural tourist aspect to it, and these things did for a very long time coexist alongside one another, right? A, culture, a cultural space, a religious space, would become a tourist one. Um, so while we were at the site, there was a sheikh who narrated to us the history of that place. Um, in the distance beyond the museum that had been built, kind of around the tomb that was there, I could see a cemetery. We could see this cemetery built into a mountain of sand. Uh, deep green poplars, which are a quintessential sign of, of the oasis towns around especially the south part of this region, stood in stark contrast to the beige sea of sand that lay beyond. And my acquaintance led us down to a stream in which was trickling clear and pure spring water. So we crouched down together so that she, um, she had brought a bottle with her just so she could collect some of this water from the stream there. And she said to me, can't you see why people would think a place like this was holy? And I could, and I still do. So this idea that people can see their land as holy, this idea that Uyghurs would see <coughs> their land as holy and would have reverence for anything beyond sort of the CCP and its own vision is precisely one of the things that I think the party fears so much. Um, and I think one question, right, that I, that I know I ask all the time and that I hope maybe comes out in the question and answer session and, and further commentary is why the state is putting so much effort into demolishing so many of the things that in, in some senses it helped to build and helped to sustain for a, a very long time, even as it continues to claim that it cares for Uyghur culture and religion. So I think, I think the state is you know, demolishing things and opening up space that it is then wanting to turn around and fill with itself. Um, and I see a lot of my Uyghur friends here in the audience, and I just want to wrap up by sharing with you um, something that, that I think of often that gives me some hope for this situation. Um, one of my favorite proverbs in the Uyghur language is one that I often share at public events and on social media, and it says, bulmas," or you can't cover the sun with a coat flap. In other words, the truth always comes out. And I commend the work of the NED, the UHRP, Bahram, my fellow commentators here, and, uh, and all of us who are gathered here in continuing to re reveal the truth of what is happening in this situ situation. Not all hope is lost. Thank you, Elise. <laughs>
Omar? Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the NED to, you know, co-hosting this event. And thank you, Carl, for your uh, support. Uh, so uh, many people you know, uh, compare the current uh, crackdown, current crisis, you know, to uh, cultural revolution, what's happening in the region, the cultural revolution. We have been telling them that it's uh, unprecedented unprecedented, but they, uh, we cannot compare even the current crackdown with the cultural revolution. Uh, the uh, research of uh, Bahram Sinta shows us that uh, it is really unprecedented, Be because some of the mosques which uh, survived uh, cultural revolution have been demolished uh, during this crackdown. And also, it uh, shows uh, that the Chinese intention very clearly that it wants to culturally exterminate the Uyghur people. And we are very concerned that wars will come. Because, as you know, in November 1938, <coughs> 9 and 10 November, the Nazis destroyed and demolished more than 250 synagogues and uh, Jewish cemeteries. So what's ha happening? If there is no a strong international reaction, this destruction of uh, widespread destruction of Uyghur mosques, Uyghur shrines and cemeteries shows if there is no uh, strong international reaction to stop China, the wars will happen. So international community should take a, you know, a strong uh, action to stop China before the wars come, before unthinkable happen in uh, East Turkestan against the Uyghur people. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> I just wanted to make two quick comments before we turn it open to questions and answers from the audience. And one, one of the, the parts of the report that really caught my attention was the, and I understand that it's not, um, you haven't been able to document it entirely yet, but the sort of the, um, what's the word? I claim is the wrong word I'm looking for. But the idea that they're, they're ab abolishing and destroying all but one mosque in each area, in the sense of, is that driven by an idea of surveillance and control? Um, is that universal across the entire province? Is the idea that you get rid of all of the local mosques, all the local shrines, and then you sort of concentrate all of the religious learning, all of the scholarship, all of the symbolism in one area that allows for greater control? I just thought when I was reading through the report that it, was, it wasn't a blanket destruction, but a really sort of controlled, regulated, and systematic effort to what leads me to conclude a really a control mechanism along with the, the surveillance state. And the other th part of the report that there was just a passing reference to, which I thought was interesting, was the connection between this effort and the timing of it and the introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative. There was one reference in the report to the Belt and Road Initiative and the need to control or use the Uyghur Autonomous Region to access and sort of promote their Belt and Road Initiative. So those are just two general comments I, I took away from the report other than the really, I, I kept, again, commend you on the seriousness of the research, the diligence of it, the, the bringing facts to bear on this subject matter is really profoundly important. But let me turn, the, turn it over to the audience now. Please introduce yourself. Keep your questions as brief as possible. Let's start over here, Fred. There's a mic coming, too. Um, hi, I'm Fred Hyatt from the Washington Post editorial page. <coughs> Thank you for this. Um, this seems obvious to you, I'm sure, but I wonder if you could explain to us some of the challenges of reporting on this, both in compiling the report and in your sure. day to day work. Why don't you have, uh, you know, before and after pictures from on the ground? Uh, what? Anyway, you, you get what I'm asking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, uh, 
uh, Radio Free Asia Uyghur services, uh, our impact seems to be very uh, important now everywhere. But uh, we have only, uh, right now we have 11 service members. We had 13, but two of them quit for different reasons. But uh, RFA Uyghur service, uh, entire RFA, we don't have anyone in China because China sees RFA pretty much as a hostile radio station. So China has never allowed us to operate there. And uh, we don't have stringers in entire China, including the Uyghur region. And uh, prior to the arrival of Chen Quanguo, we did have a lot of sources we were able to call and uh, confirm and cover the events on the ground, whether that's Hotan, Kashgar, or any other parts. But after the arrival of Chen Quanguo, and after the creation of uh, what many scholars, experts call this high-tech police state, uh, China using the big data and the new platform, uh, they are able to basically collect the voices, not uh, only the Uyghurs, you know, the, their DNA, uh, other biological information, also the voice of possibly, we believe, the, our reporters. So the way we conduct the interviews is through calling, target calling, police stations, mosques, you know, uh, you know, cadres, local residents, all that. But China has been aggressively blocking these calls. And also, they can immediately recognize these calls coming from US, North America. They can just block them out. After we were initially successfully uh, cover and confirm a number of instances and uh, the things that were happening, especially about the mass detention of the Uyghurs, including 120,000 or more Uyghurs detained in Kashgar alone. In Hotan Karakash County, 40% of, of the adult Uyghur population were detained. Then there was a director by the Chinese government to the police stations, whatnot, never take calls from overseas, special radios, anything suspicious. And so it has become extremely difficult to uh, cover and confirm these uh, things. But still, uh, in spite of, uh, and in addition, uh, another layer I would add is, China has been holding hostage of the, our loved ones, of the Uyghur service members. Uh, six of them went public, and others who have not gone public, their loved ones are uh, either in detention or under direct threat of the Chinese government. So in spite of all of this, I think our fair Uyghur service has done a, a great job uh, in uh, uncovering what is happening, in breaking the stories, in telling the world exactly, uh, you know, uh, what Chinese government narr narrative is incorrect. So these are the challenges we face at RFA uh, Uyghur service. Obviously, we're interested in doing more, hopefully with more support you know, from elsewhere. I think uh, maybe Beckham wants to you know, explain yeah. more about his side. Uh, yeah. RFA <coughs> uh, Uyghur service, service is one of the main uh, source uh, for, for the reporters and other organizations. Also, I use many evid evidences uh, I use the sources from uh, RFA Uyghur service. Since 2016, uh, RFA started to report demolishing of Uyghur mosques and neighborhoods. Uh, so th at the time, uh, I, I had the idea to start this type of uh, investigation on using the Google imagery and the proof that RFA is report using the techniques and the, uh, because uh, image can prove everything because it, it clearly uh, we, we can have strong evidence to prove RFA's report. So 140 uh, demolished mass sites uh, can 100% uh, prove China actually did destroy Uyghur uh, mass uh, cemeteries. So we, w my report and also RFA's report, we, we can um, define our uh, evidences. Uh, so, uh, yeah. May I follow up with that? Were, were you able to, in part of the research, were you able to reach out to anyone still in the area to confirm the material, or was it all done through satellite imagery and s interviews with people in exile now outside yeah. of the country? It's not possible to, I can uh, contact with anyone in there. So imagery pr prove everything. In the Google, we see must art dis disappear on the map. This can prove 100%. Uh, but but also I contacted with Uyghurs overseas who uh, from their, uh, their ma motherland uh, or their town or uh, and, uh, the cities, they uh, proved, uh, identified the mosque, 
name and inf some information and their personal uh, experience. So th these also uh, side uh, evidences to um, make more um, information for each uh, demolished site. So, uh, I uh, contacted Uyghurs overseas. Mm -hmm. you know? right. Some of the g people can also uh, d provide the information about the imams of the mosque. So th they also uh, testified the imams also d being detained before mosques are demolished. Anybody? Um, yes, I. When when I started this uh, uh, research, many Uyghurs overseas contacted with me and reported their their must in their neighborhood are destroyed. So this is a very valuable uh, part of my research because I didn't collect this information all by myself. Uyghurs overseas provided this m important information, and then I prove it using Google imagery. Uh, prove their uh, claim that their must are demolished. In, uh, in the Google imagery, it's, it's really demolished, and uh, I use those information. In Do you want to? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll jump in and, and, um, and follow up a little bit just to add a, a bit more. It is, it, it's quite simply just too dangerous for people in the region to have contact with people outside. Yeah. So it's, it's certainly the case that um, people who were my research collabor collaborators, my neighbors, my close friends, right, have, have deleted me. Maybe that makes more sense, but even, even Uyghurs from the region like Bahram, cannot be in touch uh, with family, with friends, who with anyone who, who knows what the on-the-ground situation is like. Can, can I follow up with that on this yeah. question, which is, and, I, and the image you're painting is um, one of almost a pervasive, uh, a police state that has no connection to the outside world. In a sense, it's really walled it off. But if you look at other examples, whether it's the Tibetans or the Burmese in the past or even the North Koreans, there is a degree of sort of movement of people that isn't tied to politics. Migrant workers, um, people who live in neighboring countries. Are you suggesting that the control of the Chinese, uh, in, of the Uyghurs, is so pervasive that even those people-to-people -people family contacts are now too dangerous to use to gather any information? Are we at that stage of a police state in East Turkestan that allows no inf almost no information no matter how innocuous to leave or to leave the leave the area or actually be transmitted back into it through personal family connections is that where we are today we uh, uh, published a report a few weeks back about the harassment of the Uyghur Americans by the Chinese uh, government so uh, China uh, Chinese authorities already extended its uh, their long arms to other countries uh, even to, to the United States. You know, in the United States, uh, there are about uh, 5,000, we estimate there are 5,000 5, Uyghurs. But only a few of them, you know, dare to come forward and tell their story uh, about what's happening to their relatives. The others are so scared because Chinese agents still, as we speak here, you know, keep calling the Uyghurs in the US and other countries, threatening them, or uh, let their relatives call them and ask them not to involve in any kind of activities or be silent. So therefore, uh, people are so scared mm. to come forward and you know, tell their story. Right. Let me take, we've got a the lot of questions. So let me get three what, questions. Yeah. Yes. The other source of uh, information, uh, but it's not now uh, so useful, the Chinese uh, you know, authorities themselves you know, put some of these images of these uh, camps, concentration camps, and uh, the, uh, the people they detain in the, uh, uh, these camps, they uh, put it in their uh, you know, websites, you know, proudly to show the central government maybe, the leadership that they are doing whatever you know, the uh, leadership asking them to do. So, yeah. I just want to add a little bit. Um, it's very, imp uh, the open source uh, researching is very important, for example, I cannot contact with my family members. I don't know my father is uh, died or alive right now, but I can see the the mosques are the most next to my neighborhood. So that means uh, the China cannot block uh, the Google imagery, so we could see the evidences. But I cannot contact with my family members. Th this means if China opened the internet, how much information could be revealed? 
we could see the horrific uh, crimes that take taking place in our homelands. Great. We have a lot of questions, so let's do let's take two at a time. Let's start in the front and then in the middle here. Wait for the microphone, please. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my question is to Can you introduce uh, yourself, please. My name is Zubaira Shamsin from Vigor Human Rights Project. Um, thank you, Elise, your wonderful presentation. You kind of just drew a picture about my homeland, and you made me really emotional. And this is great, but my question is, um, as you an observer, I think, I guess, you are the person that who came from our homeland the latest, because personally myself, I haven't visited my homeland over two dec decades. So we don't really know. I mean, I'm really kind of looking forward to hear he exactly what's going on from the people like yourself. My question is, um, despite all the suppression that especially Chinese government kind of legalized for Uyghurs to express the Uyghur identity as a cr crime, like Uyghurs are just unable to express themselves as a Uyghur, probably you are the kind of latest observer about all this situation. Um, so despite all this crackdown, all this suppression, always just to wipe out, what do you see about the Uyghurs keeping the identity in the homeland? You know, how, how, what, what, what's your observation or prediction that uh, the Uyghurs in East Turkestan, are they are still strong enough to keep hold of what they believe in? Thank you. Great. Let's go in the back middle here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I note that about 12, 15% of these people are Kazakhs. And very quietly, the Kazakhs have paid some bribes to get some people out of these camps. So there may be a population you can interview in Kazakhstan. If the United States did any of this in the US, they would literally be a 30 country world war against the United States. And I don't get it, why China gets a pass. Isn't your primary task to talk to every Muslim country on the face of the earth and say, why are you letting China get away with this? Why, haven't you, why aren't you f freezing every Belt and Road pro project that passes through Muslim lands? Why hasn't the single country severed diplomatic relations with China over this unbelievable treatment of Muslims? I don't get it. Help me understand. Okay. Let's actually take a third question at the same time right here. In the uh, Jennifer Wells, I'm a professor at George Washington University, and we're working on a project on war crimes and cultural genocide. Um, my question was, is there any evidence as to what China is doing with you know, the, the mosques or edifices after they destroy them, i.e., are they selling these or um, some of the more kind of cultural artifacts that you might associate in these historic towns, what's becoming of them, or is it just rubble? Great. All right, so we have three questions. One on sort of how do the Uyghurs keep their and maintain their identity under, under assault? In a sense, the question that Carl raised of why is there not a broader international response, particularly from the broader Muslim world? And then in essence, what are the Chinese, what is the CCP doing with the relics and the other artifacts that in a sense could be harvested from these uh, destructions? So if each of you wants to take, take a small piece of it so we can uh, go through yeah. all the questions. I'll start by her uh, question. Um, the, the demolishing religious sites uh, is happening all around the China. When it comes to Uyghur land, uh, this become like three times more um, crime as compared to other cities of, in uh, China. So they almost demolished about 10,000 sites uh, based on my research. Uh, this, this number is horrific. This is a very large number. So. Um, the reason why they do it and how they uh, see this uh, is right, because China want to uh, erase the the religion as well as the culture when when it comes to Uyghur. So <coughs> they think this is right for them. It is important for them to do it to d define their yeah. Is there any evidence that they're using them to sort of manufacture tourist locations, sell them for profit? Yeah, yeah. Do they, they use uh, market the somewhere? most of the most are located in the uh, the, the right a uh, very good part of the, the the town or cities. They use the space for other uh, building. No, no, I guess I guess the question yeah. is like <laughs> it, the, the mosques themselves must have a lot of his, some of the mosques in your report date back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I think the oldest one, if I remember correctly, was 
from the 12th century, yeah. 11th or 12th century. Is there any evidence that the artifacts, the precious artwork that was in the mosque is appearing in, if I understand your question, oh. is it appearing in Sorry. black markets? Is it being used to sort of oh. create Potemkin villages that look like something else to attract tourists? Like, do we know, do yeah, we have yeah. any evidence? And if you don't know, that's I, perfectly separate. Like, do we know, is there any evidence that this? I don't, I, don't, I, I don't have evidence of this, but I can prove uh, there's beautiful, uh, the part of the, every building, there's a beautiful architecture, materials, they could do, maybe they just destroyed it. Maybe if they're valuable things they could sell. Yeah. That's I'm sorry for the <laughs> misunderstood question. It's an excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's <Yeah. laughs> an excellent question right. that I think warrants. So do you want to, each of you take, a pe there are three really interesting questions. So maybe if you want to take yeah. the identity sure. question of, in the sense of right. how are they preserved, how, how are Uyghurs working to preserve their identity, their religion, their culture, their language under the assault? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's an important one, and it's also a big one, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so I tried to jot down a, f a few notes to, to keep my response kind of contained. Um, I think, and I hope this doesn't sound you know, too flippant or broad, but I think humans, humans as, as a lot are, are resilient in general, and I think, um, Part of the reason why I have hope for Uyghur culture and Uyghur identity back in the homeland moving forward, right, is that we saw a flourishing of Uyghur culture and Uyghur identity following the Cultural Revolution with all the tumult, tumult right, that that decade entailed. Um, then the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s, we saw this wonderful and beautiful flourishing of Uyghur culture and a revival in many senses back in the homeland. Um, I think if we look across the border into the former Soviet Union and into Islamic and cultural revival in places like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and so forth, following the, the fall of the Soviet Union, that's also an example that can give us a lot of hope for what sort of possibilities um, lay ahead of us, right, in the future. I think uh, also I traveled to the region last summer for a brief trip, just two weeks, um, and, and I certainly encountered people who kind of whispered, murmured, you know, notes of despair to me. But um, I also drew a little bit of hope personally from seeing people still trying to figure out how to forge normal lives to the best extent that they could as they went about their daily existence. That's another thing to give hope. And I think that also we can have hope from the fact that there are people like you in the diaspora, right, working. And I think that a as a group of people dedicated to this cause outside the Uyghur homeland, um, we can all do a lot to support a flourishing Uyghur culture, a flourishing Uyghur language, right, that can then um, in, in the future, if, when things get better, right, that can then feed back into the homeland. Great. Yeah. I want to take one of the questions, perhaps one of you on the, uh, why is the, the international community so silent on this issue? Just, uh, just, I just wanted uh, to add to what uh, Alice said. Uh, Alice said that so the Uyghurs uh, have a rich culture, a long history. And uh, this uh, current crackdown also uh, alert the Uyghurs to, you know, to stick to their culture more strongly and to, you know, uh, and they are now in the diaspora, they are uh, cre uh, establishing uh, language schools, mm -hmm. cultural centers in order to, you know, to keep their uh, 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 culture and language alive. And uh, of course, the Chinese government's policy will, you know, harm the Uyghurs, you know, culturally, linguistically, because they already put hundreds of thousands of Uyghur uh, uh, orphans in state uh, orphanages and they don't allow them to speak Uyghur. They are, uh, you know, maybe they will grow with the uh, Chinese culture, Chinese language. They will not be able to speak uh, even the Uyghur. But uh, as I said, the uh, foundation of the Uyghur culture and Uyghur tradition is very strong and uh, uh, Uyghur will, you know, survive and will keep uh, their uh, culture <coughs> alive. Yeah. Cool. I can talk about the uh, coverage uh, uh, 
our interviews with uh, camp survivors, especially uh, in Kazakhstan, Kazakhs included. We actually interviewed uh, pretty much the most, uh, 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 I would say, the most out outspoken ones. You know, uh, we have interviewed, for example, one of the first camp survivor was Umar Bekali. You know, he came as a Kazakh citizen. He's immigrated to Kazakhstan, became a citizen upon his return to visit his parents. He was detained by the Chinese authorities for nine months in two different camps, uh, accusing him of terrorism and whatnot. At the end of the day, when the Kazakh government got involved, he was released. Uh, he was threatened by the authorities, say, we have your parents, relatives here. If you open your mouth, you know what happens to them. But still, he came out, he spoke, and uh, we interviewed him many times. Then after that, we interviewed like uh, Camp Surah Gulzira, Abul Khan Qazi, and uh, Saira Gulsabtai, who is now in Sweden. Many times she, although now the camp survivor, she actually taught Mandarin Chinese to the detainees. And we uh, frequently interviewed uh, the head of the Atta uh, human rights organization, Serik Chambilash. And uh, he was very outspoken, condemning Chinese government's incarceration of the Kazakhs, Uyghurs, and others. Uh, became very active until the Kazakh government shut down his office and basically detain him in the capital for several months and forcing him to basically sign a plea to either keep his mouth shut or sentenced to five years. Now he signed it. He's been kind of quiet, but uh, his organization, Ata uh, got registered in Kazakhstan. Others also became very active. So the first camp survivors uh, all were able to come out of China are the ones who had uh, who have foreign connections. Either they are citizens of foreign country or their wife or husbands have citizens of foreign country. A couple of Uyghurs came out, same. For example, Mekril Tursun, who lives in the US now, uh, has married with an Egyptian. And also uh, we have Zumret Dawood also, uh, who married to a Pakistani man. So, but uh, we have not seen uh, any Uyghurs who are men or women who are married with Uyghur. Both couples are Uyghur, and uh, they have no foreign connections at all. Not a single one of them uh, has been able to come out of uh, the region. Uh, we did know some of the elderly, in a way, dying Uyghurs, maybe Kazakhs, others, were released by the Chinese authorities. We did a lot of stories of those as well. Uh, some of them just uh, died soon after their release, a month later or a couple of months later. So for the record, I'd like to say we did you know, interview this, uh, not just Uyghurs, we did an uh, interview. Uh, we confirmed a lot of uh, the detention of prominent Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and Uzbeks. So China is not just targeting the Uyghurs, targeting Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tatars, all the indigenous Turkic populations, except the Han Chinese in the Uyghur homeland. Can I want to I yeah. go back to this, this internet, the Carl raised it, uh, the gentleman in the middle, about the, the international response. And I, instead of asking, in a sense, why aren't governments responding, because I think the answer there is really mm -hmm. quite grotesque but obvious. But what is, are your reports being picked up and disseminated by other me international media? Al Jazeera, are you reaching out to the Malaysian, the Pakistani, the Turkish press? What is the international outreach that you are personally engaged in your organizations to ensure that these stories are beginning to be heard, disseminated, mm -hmm. sp spread globally? Um, because I, I mean, the, the foreign policy question is interesting, um, but we're not gonna get there now. But I'm just curious, like, are you translating your material into other languages? Are you reaching out with the other um, language services at VOA or RFA? Are they being picked up by counterparts, satellite TV stations? that have a global reach. How are you disseminating your work and are you targeting particular countries or regions of the world? For RFA Uyghur service, uh, we, of course, we're a small service. Uh, our mandate is to broadcast to the targeted Uyghur region. But uh, since the camp issue became a major issue, we have been doing our best to produce at least three to four translations of most important issues, cases. Uh, these are translated into English, mm -hmm. released by our English department, picked up by uh, most major media. And a lot of this major media, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, all, and CNN, Al Jazeera, all, you know, they come to us for tips, for information, mm -hmm. 
and sometimes because they are reporters want to visit the Uyghur homeland to see what is happening on their own. So they contact us, ask us advices. We kind of provide them the general advice. So they go, they interview. Many of them initially when they contact us, uh, they're in a kind of like disbelief situation, especially our reports. Some of them do not directly express that, but they felt we were exaggerating mm. the situation. But after they came back from the trips, they basically uh, tell us, you know, oh, we had stacks of your reports before we went to Rimchi Kashgar Hotel, Turfan. Uh, we were like, it couldn't be this bad. But, uh, but after we went there, we saw what we saw. We realized you are only reporting the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just, yeah. no. sorry. Oh. Okay. So, uh, um, <coughs> first of all, why uh, uh, the Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries, are not, uh, you know, uh, speaking up uh, on the Uyghur crisis. First of all, I think that all, uh, most of the Muslim countries themselves are uh, violators of the human rights, so they don't want to discuss this issue with the, uh, China. The second thing is Chinese diplomats, uh, like in the U.S. and other Muslim countries, are very active. They can move freely. Uh, finally, U.S. government t uh, took some actions to at least you know, restrict their movement, so they can go anywhere and tell their uh, side of the story to the politicians and it is visi very easy for them to convince that uh, most of the uh, pol politicians. And the third uh, reason is uh, the ruling elite in the Muslim countries have some economic you know, connections with the Chinese government. So therefore they d uh, don't want to uh, do anything to make you know China upset, and we are of course we are uh, uh, disseminating our uh, reports to every everybody. We are trying to reach international media, and we send our new copies, our reports, but it is in English. We have not been able to trans uh, uh, in Chinese, of course, and uh, we have not been able to to uh, translate uh, our reports into Arabic or Turkish because of the financial, you know, <laughs> lack of financial resources. So we uh, uh, are now, uh, we uh, uh, are uh, planning to, you know, at least to translate summary of our reports, our press releases into Arabic and uh, into other, uh, you know, uh, f uh, in Turkish uh, to, you know, to uh, can reach out, you know, more easily to these uh, uh, people in do those countries. But there are, uh, of course, because of the social media, uh, and also there is an instruction from the uh, Muslim majority uh, government not to cover this issue. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they don't cover, because, you know, this uh, international uh, media has been, have been covering the Uyghur issue uh, you know, for uh, almost uh, one, two years, but uh, there is no much coverage in Arabic, on Persian or Turkish uh, media, because uh, we heard, you know, f from the uh, some uh, journalists that uh, that they cannot write anything about the Uyghur crisis because uh, their editors told them that not to, you know, do anything. So uh, we, I had some personal, you know, conversation with some. Uh, uh, journalists from Muslim uh, majority countries, and they told us openly what is going on. Yeah, Aaron, you want to? Yes, um, Uyghurs uh, overseas uh, have first-hand uh, evidences of uh, many uh, uh, these things happen in the Uyghur homeland. So, for example, must uh, demolishing must, and the first month after I started my uh, investigation, I collected 30 demolished must locations, and I tutored on a tutor, and then. The the one of the l uh, biggest uh, news agents, AFP uh, reporters, contacted with me and asked me to provide uh, the list of demolished mass uh, coordination locations uh, of, the, of, the, of the Google imagery. And then they used 30 uh, demolished mass evidence in their report. And then the report, after the report published, the, the report translated to many different languages and be become one the first uh, deep uh, report about the demolishing must and then they they uh, I collected the information and provided to them but I d I cannot visit the, my homeland uh, to see but the reporters can have chance to visit some of the uh, 
uh, side sites that I provided to them. They visit it and see in the real eye and they take picture of the demolishing bus sites. And then the other deep uh, report published last month is also about the demolishing cemeteries. So I, my uh, evidence and my uh, research helped them to uh, start their report about uh, right. this uh, particular topic. We have time for one, one final question. Let's go right up. Yes. Okay, my name is Yashe Cao um, from China Change. Uh, let me see if I'm the only one <laughs> who's <laughs> Chinese here. I <laughs> uh, hope not. Um, so my question, uh, the more, more narrowly, is I, I sitting here, I'm wondering, I'm always struck at any Uyghur event that uh, how um, ba imbalanced the information is between uh, what we now hear after you know two years of intense report about the Uyghur situation and what the Chinese know, even the overseas Chinese or Chinese inside China who scaled the wall uh, on Twitter still just know very little. Just that, I mean, just huge imbalance there. So I was thinking actually when before the question was raised uh, whether uh, we could uh, somehow translate why that happened that been done already. Translate some of your report, you know, RFA um, Uyghur report into Chinese. Uh, it's through your own Chinese language service, you have a whole um, infrastructure there and the network. And there was a guy on Twitter uh, whose uh, handle is a uh, Uyghur speaker. He used to translate uh, your report into Chinese, and I would uh, retweet it. But that's a narrow. Uh, informal way of uh, spreading, you know. So that's one uh, question. Just so we could all, this could uh, I among Uyghurs, a lot of uh, a lot of them ch speak a fluent Chinese. They could do the translation, or we could uh, organize it, you know. So that's uh, that's something I think uh, that uh, should be done. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, a few years ago, uh, around the the uh, in the 2000s, during the 2000s, for at least quite, if not a decade, there was a website called the Even, uh, simply called the Translation. It translates uh, um, major Western media and reports on China into Chinese. It was hugely popular, huge. And uh, around 2011, 2012, it stopped abruptly when New York Times has its own Chinese website and web FT has its own web Chinese website. And I think, Carl, my, my suggestion, I think it's time to revive that site because uh, there has been so much, the Uyghur issue, Tibet issue, Taiwan issue, Hong Kong issue, and also there are so much commentary analysis about China in, in the last couple of years coming out and I, I see no seizing of that. And that information should be brought to the hungry Chinese readership once again. New York Times website is not enough. Great. So I really just made a comment, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so we're, that's that's perfect. It's a perfect way to end because there's no question there. It's just sort of, it's an obvious need. And I, I would just want to conclude by really applauding Bahram um, on the, the quality of your research, the diligence, uh, I must say the creativity, um, that this is one of the hardest places in the world. There are other difficult ones, North, North Korea, Eritrea, there are other ones. But what is happening in East, East Turkestan requires creativity. Um, the outreach, the advocacy, but also the documentation and research. These are the places we really need to work hard to really paint a full picture, a verifiable picture, an accurate picture. And I would applaud RFA, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, um, and everyone else engaged in this effort. So please join me in thanking uh, our four speakers. Thank you. Thank you.